We were in a great discussion about the Ukraine war um, because we spent eight trillion dollars on wars. We've spent all of these, all of these interventions that we had after 9/11, where all of these, the architects of them, these neoconservatives, after that, you know, they were shut out of government. Right? They kind of left. They were disgraced, and now they're popping up again. They're popping up again as Democrats, and they are the main. A lot of them are uh, some of the main. Uh, promoters of the idea of this endless war in the Ukraine. Yeah, and I mean that's one of my one of the things my uncle figured out when he uh, four months into his administration. You know, he had been warned by Eisenhower about the emergence of the military-industrial complex, which would turn America into an imperial state abroad and a surveillance state, a garrison state, a security state at home. And uh, you know, Eisenhower had said the thing that our our founding fathers had said. You cannot maintain democracy if you're an imperial state abroad. You're gonna, you know, you'll bankrupt the middle class. You'll, um, you'll, uh, you'll, uh, you'll turn us into a surveillance state. My uncle, four months in, recognized that. You know, when he was lied to by the CIA, by Alan Dulles, Charles Cabal, Richard Bissell, and by the military brass about the Bay of Pigs. And when the men were dying on the beach, you know, he took public blame for it. But he privately told his aides, I want to take the CIA, shatter it into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. And um, and then he fired Alan Dulles, Richard Bissell, and Charles Cabell, the guys who were directly responsible for lying to him. But for the next thousand days of his administration, he was in a pitched battle to keep our country out of war. They wanted the wars because that was the, he recognized that their job had devolved into providing the military industrial complex, military contractors, a constant pipeline of new wars to feed their profits. Well, in, you know, the neocons, uh, which are neoconservatives for people who don't know, it's a movement that started in the uh, early 1990s, around 92, when the, when the uh, Berlin Wall came down and they published uh, a document that called the Project for New American Century that said that because we were the victor in the Cold War, that America now had the uh, the, the right to rule the world uh, for a century or more at, by using its superior military powers, the unit power. So after 2001, we spent, between then and now, we spent $8 trillion on wars on regime change wars. It was the Iraq war and then all these spillover wars in Yemen, Libya, Syria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, et cetera. What did we get for those wars? Here's what we got. Iran, Iraq is now worse off than we found it. It's an incoherent kind of battle between Shia and Sunni death squads. We killed more Iraqis than Saddam Hussein. We pushed, we killed between 650,000 and a million Iraqis. We have pushed Iraq into a proxy posture with Iran, which is exactly the foreign policy outcome we've been trying to avoid for decades. Uh, we, in the spillover war in Syria, we created ISIS. We sent 2 million refugees into Europe and destabilized every democracy in Europe. You know, we, we created Brexit. Right. The riots that are now happening in France are a direct result of that, those wars. And we bankrupted the American middle class because we didn't have the money to pay for them. So, and that is, you know, what we got. And then we're given these kind of comic book depictions each time, you know, whether it's Gaddafi, whether it's Assad, um, we're given this, this, this caricature of, you know, okay, there's a bad guy here and there's a good guy. We're the good guys. We're always the good guys. And here's the bad guy. And it's a, it's a black and white debate. There is no question about it. If you side with the bad guy, if you question, ask questions about, you know, the action, it means you're on the side of Putin or something. Right. Right. And right. That, that whole game. So um, the, the, what happened, I mean, the thing people should know about Ukraine war, we were told it's, you know, Putin wants to be the new Hitler. He wants yeah, to invade, invade Europe and right. Right. And, but when you look at what actually happened, it's much more complex than that and much more nuanced. Putin actually steadfastly resisted going to war. He's, he has said, and the Russians, not just Putin, but all the Russian leaderships had said since 1992, 
if you move NATO to the east, you're going to provoke a violent response. We, we, you know, uh, Russia's been invaded three times through Ukraine. The last time, Hitler killed one out of every seven Russians. So they, they you know, it's a national security priority for them. Uh, Ukraine cannot be under the control of a hostile foreign power. They can't tolerate that. And all of our greatest diplomats, George Kennan, who was the architect of the containment policy after World War II, have constantly reiterated that if you go into Ukraine with NATO, you're going to force Russians to have a violent response. Well, so uh, here's what happened. In 2014, we put $5 billion into the Medan, into funding the Medan Rebellion, which is this, you know, uprising in Ukraine against the duly elected government of the Ukraine, which was neutral and maybe leaned a little towards Russia. But we wanted them out and we paid $5 billion to, in a, in a series of demonstrations that ended in a coup d'etat against that regime and the installation of a pro-American regime. Putin wants to settle things. Immediately, the first thing the new pro-American regime did was it made it illegal to speak the Russian language in Donbass and Lugansk. And it um it and banned then, Russian political parties too, right? Yes. Yeah. And when the when Russian ethnic Russians, which are ninety percent of that population, when they began peaceful demonstrations, they were attacked violently, and ultimately they it started a civil war. Fourteen thousand more killed. The civil war really began in twenty fourteen. Russia tried to settle it. The people of those provinces voted to join the Russian Union, right? And and Putin said, no. So this is not consistent with the portrait of him. And then he said, we need a peace treaty that protects these people. I don't want to go in there, but we need a peace treaty. And he agreed, he negotiated with France, Germany, England, and, um, and the U and Ukraine to, uh, on a peace treaty to organize a peace treaty called the Minsk Accords that would have left Donbass and Lugansk part of Ukraine as a semi-autonomous region able to speak their own language and that would have permanently kept NATO out of Ukraine. It was a reasonable settlement. Um, Zelensky, who's a comedian and an actor, campaigns in 2019 and wins he has no political experience, but he wins in a landslide. 70% of Ukrainians support him. Why? He ran on one issue, peace. He said, I'm going to sign the Minsk Accords and I'm going to get it ratified in the Ukrainian parliament. The Ukrainian people did not want a war. They wanted peace. He gets in there and suddenly he pivots. Now, why did he pivot? Nobody knows. But I think it's fair guess that he pivoted for two reasons. One is that ultra-nationalists in his government and the Azov Battalion um, told him that they would kill him if he negotiated a peace with Russia. And neocons, particularly Victoria Nuland in the U.S. White House and State Department, told him the same thing, that he could not sign a peace accord. So he abandons it. Russia goes in, Putin goes in, but only with 40,000 people. Well, he's got a lot more. He's got a million, 1.2 million reserves, but he only sends 40,000 people in there. Why? This is a nation of 44 million people, Ukraine. Clearly, he's not trying to con conquer Ukraine with 40,000 troops. Right. He wanted to bring us to the negotiating table. So, and this, and, and this, they go in on January. In March, almost nobody's been killed at that point compared to what's happened now. Zelensky says, okay, let's negotiate peace. He comes back to the negotiating table. And they, but the U.S. won't help him. So he has to go to Israel and Turkey to get their help negotiating a peace accord. They negotiate a peace accord, which is, uh, which is Minsk Accords 2.0 with Putin. Zelensky initials it, the Russians initial it, and the Russians start withdrawing their troops from Ukraine in good faith. What happens then? Biden sends Boris Johnson over there, the UK prime minister, to torpedo that peace agreement. And uh, and he and Zelensky to tear it up. And since then, 
400,000 Ukrainian kids have been killed on the front lines. And, uh, yeah. and, you know, all of those kids and mothers and every one of those lives was an unnecessary tragedy. And, you know, you know, my son went over there and fought. I did not know that, but I had, I had, I had heard something like that. And that's amazing. Yeah, well, he and I disagreed with the war. Yeah. And, you know, I have tremendous respect for him and he believed what he was doing. He had great sympathy for the Ukrainian people, which I share, which Cheryl and I share. Of course. He the had, people uh, are never and, the ones and for their valor. They always suffer. Right. And um I but, that's a that's a badass thing for him to do. It shows his character to go over there and, and fight with the Ukrainian people. And, I mean we didn't know that he was going. Yeah, he didn't I, tell I would not help if Manhattan Beach was invaded. You know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't even do that. So the idea yeah, that he would go to the Ukraine. Starbucks and yeah, I would yeah, go. You're a yeah, I would tweet about it. I go through. so sad. The ransacking of Manhattan Beach. I would not. Who cares? I'm unaffected. Traffic. I'm unaffected. But no, that's that's an amazing thing. And what uh, is 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 he still there? Is he? Oh, he's back. But he was in. He fought in the Kharkiv offensive. He was a machine gunner. I mean, you tell what happened. Yeah, I mean. Well, he 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 told us he was going somewhere, but wouldn't tell us where. Yeah. Um, because he said he didn't want us to be worried. Yeah. Um, I mean, would, this and, would qualify as worry. Yeah, and then so after he left, of course we were worried because you know if somebody says don't worry, right, I'm gonna be okay. It's like, what. Well, well, what are you doing? Right. Um, and then we started seeing some credit card uh, charges in Poland, and we, you know, put two and two together. And right. But, but we couldn't reach him. We couldn't. We couldn't communicate with him. Right. It was really. It was very. It was very stressful. So he was joined a special forces um, uh, unit. He was uh, in the Foreign Legion, Ukrainian Foreign Legion, and he fought in that. Offensive as a machine gunner, first as drone operator, which is the most dangerous job because the Russians right. can tell as soon as you turn on that drone, and then they and it's an artillery, and they send artillery. The artillery kills anything within three hundred feet. Um, and and then he became a machine gunner, and um, he uh, and you know now he's back, and he's he just graduated law school, so he's safe, thank God. Uh, but all I talked to him yesterday. And all of the people that he served with have either been killed or are, are hospitalized. And, yeah. you know, it's uh, it's it's terrible. Um, but you gave a great succinct explanation. I think a lot of people are confused about uh, why we're not trying to negotiate a settlement, why we're not trying to force peace talks, why that isn't something that we're requiring, along with all of these donations and all. I mean, all of the funding and the weaponry. Um, but I think, you know, it's it's pretty clear to a lot of people that we may not want peace talks that. Well, you and, know. you know, there's people making a lot of money on this. And, That's and, right. Um, when we, you know, we committed uh, now $140 billion, you know, if if Biden gets the extra $24 billion yeah. that he's looking for. Oh, but in March, we opted to $113 billion. Well, the entire budget of EPA is $12 billion. So that's all we've got for the environment in this country. Well, we have 10 times that, or Ukraine. And, um, you know, we're having crisis here. Yeah, we have a lot of, we have millions of people in the U.S. that can't eat, that don't have enough. That have a lot of problems. 35% of Americans resources. are not making enough to pay for basic human needs. And yeah. those people are on the edge of becoming homeless. And it's a crisis. Um, the entire budget for CDC is $12 billion. When... But we got 10 times that again. When Mitch McConnell was asked in March, why are we in the, uh, why are we in the Ukraine? Why do we have enough money for this? Where's the money coming from? He said, don't worry about it. Because that money's not really going to Ukraine. It's going to U.S. military contractors, Raytheon, General Dynamics, Boeing, Lockheed. And, you know, so he admitted it. it's just a big money laundering scheme to the military industrial complex. And then if you look who do you think actually owns all of those companies? State Street, Vanguard, BlackRock. Exactly. Yes. So now you see so it all goes back to that. Yeah, they're just strip mining yeah. the, the wealth from the American middle class and shifting it upward. 
through all of these different mechanisms that yeah. you know, they're, they're literally control everything. So, I mean, and, and no one's talking about this, which is interesting. The Republicans aren't talking about it. The Democrats aren't talking about it. Um, you're the only candidate out there kind of bringing up these issues in this way. 